Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 126, Space Shuttle Flight 54, STS-56. Sun, Sky, and Spartan. Last time, we talked about STS-54, which did its part to ensure that the tracking and data relay satellite system would remain healthy even as its growing fleet of satellites aged past their design life. Today's mission is also about ensuring continuity of data, but instead of telemetry from NASA's various spacecraft, it's science related to the Sun, the Earth's atmosphere, and how the two interact. But first, you might be wondering what happened to STS-55. Why are we cutting in line? Well, as usual with the shuttle program, managing the complexities of orbiter maintenance, science payloads, dozens of astronauts, and thousands of engineers and technicians is, well, complex. And something that doesn't care one bit about that complexity is the physical universe and the unstoppable flow of time. In short, STS-55 hit some engine trouble, delaying its launch, and STS-56 was time-sensitive, so it got the slot and would be launching first but we'll get more into that next time. What was so time-sensitive on STS-56 that it got permission to send a dejected Columbia crew back to their quarters? Well, that would be Atlas II, the exciting sequel to Atlas I. If you'll recall, the first iteration of the Atmospheric Laboratory for Science and Applications launched back in March of 1992, flying on STS-45. Last episode, we were still in January of 1993, but thanks in part to STS-55's engine troubles, it's already early April, just over a year after STS-45. For the sake of consistent data, it was highly desirable to fly a follow-up mission at the same time of year as its predecessor. STS-45 paid special attention to the atmosphere of the Southern Hemisphere, so now, one year later, STS-56 is here to balance things out and study the Northern Hemisphere. Neat. Let's get into it. Commanding the mission was Ken Cameron, who we know from his flight as pilot on STS-37. On that flight, he helped out with the deployment of the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which at this point in the timeline is still happily chugging along. This is Cameron's second of three flights. Joining Cameron up front was our pilot for this mission, Steve Oswald. We last saw Oswald on STS-42, the International Microgravity Laboratory mission, He'll get his chance in the commander's seat next time, with this being his second of three flights. Mission Specialist 1 was Mike Full, who we also know. We saw Full flying as a mission specialist on STS-45, which carried the Atlas-1 suite of instruments. His experience on the previous flight was sure to come in handy, and I'm sure that he was delighted to be flying again just over a year later. He's got plenty of flying left, too, since this marks only his second of six flights. Mission Specialist 2, and our first rookie for this flight, was Ken Cockrell. Kenneth Cockrell was born on April 9, 1950 in Austin, Texas. He earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in aeronautical systems from the University of Texas and the University of West Florida, respectively. After that, the Navy taught him how to fly, putting him behind the controls of a Corsair II for a few years. He then enrolled at the Navy's Test Pilot School in Maryland before going on to test the A-4, A-7, F-4, and F-A-18. After that, he resigned from the Navy and joined the Aircraft Operations Division at the Johnson Space Center. Among other things, he was an instructor and functional check pilot for the T-38 and performed high-altitude research in the WB-57. He was selected as an astronaut in 1990, and this is his first of five flights. With all of that piloting, you might wonder what he was doing flying as a mission specialist, but he'll be on the pilot crew for all subsequent missions. Also, I couldn't find a primary source for this, but while skimming Cockrell's Wikipedia page looking for links to new sources, I saw that his nickname is listed as Taco, which was just too good to not pass on. And finally, mission specialist 3, Ellen Ochoa. Ellen Ochoa was born on May 10, 1958 in Los Angeles, California but she would tell you that she's from La Mesa, California, just outside of San Diego. Ochoa holds a bachelor's degree in physics from San Diego State University and a master's degree and doctorate in electrical engineering from Stanford University. She performed research at Sandia National Labs in New Mexico and NASA's Ames Research Center in California, investigating optical systems for performing information processing. In 1990, Ochoa traded NASA Ames for NASA Johnson, joining the astronaut corps. This is her first flight, and over the course of the next nine years, she'll fly a total of four, but she won't be done with NASA then. 
That's because Ochoa would go on to become the director of the Johnson Space Center. With our crew all sorted out, it's time to get this mission going. After all, we bumped STS-55 down the launch manifest, so the least we can do is try to get this thing flying in a timely manner. Well, slight problem there. During the first launch attempt, the countdown proceeded smoothly until the T-9 minute built-in hold. An issue with a valve in main engine number one caused a 60 minute delay while mission controllers discussed the issue. Eventually, they were satisfied and the count continued, only to abort with only 11 seconds left on the clock. In the final checks before liftoff, the computer noticed that a valve, different valve, had not indicated that it had closed. Bummer. Oh well, better safe than sorry. Two days later, everyone was ready to try again. During the second count, the same issue popped up, but this time people were ready. After the first scrub, it was determined that the valve had in fact actually closed. It just didn't report that it was closed. Additionally, during this second attempt, since they were expecting an issue, they could check other indicators to infer the valve's status. Since other indications looked good, and they knew that the valve had worked last time, the count was allowed to proceed. At T-3.5 seconds, three healthy engines roared to life, and I guess it scared the valve into getting its act together because it suddenly started reporting that yes, yes, everything was fine. So on April 8th, 1993, at 1.29 a.m., Discovery once again lit up the Florida sky. Yes, this was not just a night launch, but a middle of the night launch. So I'm sure that whether or not local residents knew about the launch ahead of time, they definitely knew about it now. The reason for the night launch is a little mysterious to me. The mission's press kit stated that it was to facilitate observation of the northern hemisphere on this mission. That leads to the natural question of, did the previous Atlas mission launch during daytime since it studied the southern hemisphere? Well, sure enough, STS-45 launched in the morning, but, well, I won't belabor this point by trying to describe a bunch of orbital geometry in an audio-only medium, but I'm not sure I understand how this can be true. I'm not quite a flight dynamics expert yet, though I am working on it, but I'm pretty sure that their orbit was going to carry them over both hemispheres an equal amount of time, regardless of what time the launch was. If anyone has any insight into what's going on here, please shoot me an email, jp at thespaceabove.us. After safely arriving in a 300 kilometer high, 57 degree inclination orbit, it was time to get to work. An hour and a half into the flight, the payload bay doors were opened, and two and a half hours after that, the Atlas II payload was activated and began collecting data. As we've grown accustomed to on these space lab flights, even the unpressurized ones, the crew split up into two teams so that they could work around the clock. On the blue team, we've got Commander Ken Cameron, Pilot Steve Oswald, and Mission Specialist Ellen Ochoa. On the red team, we've got Mission Specialists Ken Cockrail and Mike Fole. Cockrail would be the one performing the numerous orbiter attitude maneuvers required by the onboard experiments during the red team shift which makes sense since he seems to really be a pilot crew member who just happens to be flying as a mission specialist today. So now that Atlas II is happily collecting data, let's take a look through the aft windows and see what we've got back there. The one-liner summary of this mission would be that it was the latest in a line of missions that were tasked with studying the behavior of the sun, the behavior of Earth's upper atmosphere, and the interaction between the two. Maybe this goes without saying, but better understanding this interaction was extremely important. The sun rains an almost unthinkable amount of energy down on the Earth in a variety of different wavelengths. That energy then interacts with various gases in the atmosphere, which leads to complex patterns of weather and climate. This would be important work in any case, but especially with growing concern about global climate change, getting a good handle on what's really happening up there how it changes, and how those changes affect things on the ground, was a top priority, which explains why we've seen a number of missions along these lines. The Atlas instruments also provided a valuable opportunity to take finely calibrated measurements. By calibrating the instruments on the ground, taking measurements in space, and then inspecting the instruments when they got back, scientists could calibrate the data that they were getting from long-lived, uncrewed missions, like our buddy URs. Life in space can be harsh, and sensors and instruments are going to drift and degrade over time, so a mission like this was a great way to make sure that the data was still solid. We have a bunch of instruments to get through today, but we've actually seen them all before. 
all of these instruments flew on Atlas I, with a few of the Atlas I instruments staying on the ground for Atlas II. This means that we only have one unpressurized pallet out back and not the two that we saw last time. I'm not completely sure why this was the case, but looking at the payload configuration diagrams, my guess would be that they couldn't quite make the double pallet fit due to the inclusion of another payload we'll be talking about in a little bit. Since we've seen these instruments before, I'll keep this brief. Get ready for a lot of acronyms. First, we have Atmospheric Trace Molecule Spectroscopy, or ATMOS. ATMOS's job was to watch the sun as it set and rose, studying how the light was affected as it passed through different layers of Earth's atmosphere, a process known as solar occultation. Since a vehicle in low Earth orbit sees something like 30 sunrises or sunsets a day, it's a pretty good place to do an experiment like this. Atmos was so sensitive that it could reveal gases in the parts per trillion, so if there's something up there, we're going to find it. Joining Atmos in its study of the atmosphere was the Millimeter Wave Atmosphere Sounder, or MASS, or maybe M-A-S, but let's go with MASS. MASS was a big spinning dish that would collect high-frequency light from Earth's limb, basically the horizon, and analyze that light to detect the presence of ozone, water vapor, and chlorine monoxide, which can break down ozone. A very similar instrument is flying today on the Earth Observation System satellite Aura. Fun fact, in order to calibrate the sensors and pointing mechanisms on MASS, it would be pointed at something with a known radiance and position, the moon. Another instrument that measured the upper atmosphere was our old friend the Shuttle Solar Backscatter Ultraviolet Experiment, or SSBUV, which was mounted on the payload bay wall a little bit forward of the main Atlas II pallet. Strictly speaking, SSBUV was not part of Atlas II, but it sort of was. It had a similar goal and had also flown with Atlas I. Throughout the flight, it would be pointed at the sun to observe ultraviolet light conditions, and then be pointed straight down to see how much UV was reflecting back off of the atmosphere. Yet another window into what's going on in the upper atmosphere. Joining the instruments that focused on the atmosphere, we have a few that focused on the sun. Solar Spectrum Measurement, or SolSpec, did just what it says on the box, and broke down light from the sun into its various energy levels, so that scientists could understand the composition of sunlight before the atmosphere can start messing with it. The Solar Ultraviolet Irradiance Monitor kept a close eye on ultraviolet light in particular, since the amount of UV coming out of the sun varied more than other types of light. And lastly, the Active Cavity Radiometer and Solar Constant experiments measured the total energy coming from the sun and hitting the Earth. All of these experiments were operated from the ground, so there wasn't a ton of direct crew involvement. But that isn't to say that there wasn't still a heavy workload especially for the pilot crew. On every orbit, some instruments wanted to be pointed to the sun, others to earth, others to the horizon, others only to the horizon during sunrise and sunset, and during nighttime, the orbiter had to point the payload bay out into deep space to cool off. There were a lot of attitude maneuvers to be performed around the clock. And of course, there were also the occasional problems to troubleshoot. That's the nice thing about having a crew around. When something goes wrong, if you ask nicely, they'll go ahead and fix it for you. Early in the mission, there was some sort of problem related to high-rate data being sent over the KU band antenna. I wasn't able to dig up the exact nature of the problem, but it sounded like it may have been software-related. In any case, this was a problem for Atmos, which was the one instrument that really needed the high data rate transmission. Luckily for the Atmos team, the instrument just so happened to have a data recorder, presumably for this exact situation. It wasn't big enough to record the entire mission, but it was able to bridge the gap while engineers scrambled for a solution. The solution was sort of a compromise. All the data for sun rises would be stored on the recorder, while selected data for sun sets was transmitted down to Earth using a modified data format. This way, even if the recorder failed, a good chunk of data would still be saved. And if the recorder worked, then they'd have close to the nominal amount of data anyway. Well, don't sweat it, Atmos team. At the end of the mission, it turns out that the recorder worked perfectly, leading to a very happy science team. Another finicky piece of hardware was one that's a show favorite. You know, that temperamental device that prints text and graphics? Yeah, you know it. Tips. Wait, tips? What happened to tags? 
well, Tags is being replaced. Poor Tags. <laughs> this flight featured TIPS, the Thermal Impulse Printer System. I'm not sure why we're switching to TIPS, but presumably it's some sort of an upgrade. That kind of makes me wonder how long it took Tags to print stuff, because according to one source I found, TIPS would take around 44 seconds to print a single page of text, and 4 minutes to print a page of graphics. But, yeah, you heard me right. Right off the bat, TIPS ran into trouble. It seems there was some communications problem, with the device having difficulty receiving signals through the shuttle's communications gear. A similar device on the ground that was also hooked into the TDRS network was printing whenever the commands were sent, so it seemed unlikely to be a ground issue. TAGS, apparently the reliable one now, was reactivated while the issue was worked. After trying a few different things, the crew tried taking a communications cable from TIPS and using it with TAGS, which worked just fine. So they put the cable back onto TIPS, which then started working. I guess as usual, turning it off and turning it on again does the trick. It seems that throughout the flight, TIPS and TAGS sort of took turns having problems. On flight day 7, TAGS jammed, crinkling up some paper inside. And on the same day, TIPS acted up again, and they had to revert to a workaround that sent data to the troublesome printer using a portable audio data modem. <laughs> okay, this is a lot of time to spend talking about printers on the space shuttle, but I just kind of find the whole thing sort of hilarious and grimly satisfying. Somehow it's comforting to know that even NASA, with all of their expertise and engineering know-how, can't quite get a printer to work reliably. Printers are cursed. After all that frustration with tips and tags, maybe it's a good idea to relax a little with some nice, soothing music. Well, we're in luck, because mission specialist Ellen Ochoa was a flautist. And since a flute is a nice, compact, lightweight musical instrument, she brought it along. In between all the hectic orbiter maneuvers, shift changes, and maintenance, Ochoa took 20 minutes to play her instruments for her crewmates. For Commander Cameron, a Marine, she played the Marine Corps Hymn. For Mission Specialists and Navy Men Oswald and Cockrail, she played the Navy Hymn. For Wayward Brit Mike Fole, she played God Save the Queen. And to honor the April launch, she played Spring from Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Sounds pretty nice. And it's good that Ochoa had a chance to wind down, since she needed to be nice and relaxed for her next big task, deploying the free-flying Spartan 201 payload. Spartan, which is pushing it as an acronym, stands for Shuttle Point Autonomous Research Tool for Astronomy, and it's an interesting little payload. Visually, it sort of looks like if an air conditioner the size of a car had half a telephone pole stabbed through it and then was completely covered in gold foil. <laughs> You're going to think that's crazy, but check out a picture. You'll see. You'll all see. <laughs> Spartan was a free-flying payload, which would be dropped off, left to do its thing for a couple of days, and then picked back up. It had no communications abilities and was completely autonomous. On board, it had two instruments dedicated to studying the corona, the region in the sun's upper atmosphere, which, for unknown reasons, is millions of degrees in temperature. Similar instruments have been flown on sounding rockets in the past, which are big compared to hobbyist stuff, but very small compared to orbital-class rockets. They fly up, they pop out of the atmosphere for a few minutes, and they fall back down. You can get a lot of science done in just a few minutes, but you can get way more done in two days. So, you can think of this payload like a long sounding rocket flight. If all of this sounds sort of familiar, there's a reason. We've seen Spartan before. A version of it flew on STS 51G, and we also saw it study Halley's Comet in episode 92, the alternate history STS 51L episode. Of course, real life history was less kind to STS 51L, and Spartan was destroyed in the accident. But the Goddard Space Flight Center has made a new version, and we'll be seeing it catch the occasional ride in the payload bay from here on out. On flight day four, Ochoa took control of the remote manipulator system, grappled the little spacecraft, raised it up, and released it. At that moment, the crew noticed that just by chance, they were flying over Greece, with the home of the real Spartans passing serenely behind the free-flying spacecraft. I have to wonder, what would the ancient Spartans have thought of such a view? And what would they have thought about this little robot that was carrying their name among the heroes, B-52 
beasts and artifacts of their constellations. Spaceflight can be really poetic sometimes. Spartan lacked a communication system, so in order to signal that it was working properly, it did a little pirouette. This indicated both that the onboard systems had taken over, and that the attitude control system was working. Once everything was confirmed to be okay, the pilot crew gently backed Discovery away, performing a burn that allowed the orbiter to drop back around 275 kilometers behind Spartan. We'll come back in a few days. In the meantime, let's take a look at some of the secondary payloads. Joining Atlas II and SSBUV in the payload bay was the Solar Ultraviolet Experiment. The payload used the always popular Getaway Special System that the Goddard Space Flight Center provided in an effort to lower the barrier to entry for space science. Once the motorized cover opened, the experiment studied an upper band of ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun and how it affected the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a region of the atmosphere that normal people would just call space, since it extends to nearly 1,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. But as we've established, there's a lot going on in this region. Atomic oxygen, electromagnetic effects, more interaction with the sun, there is plenty to study. But what makes this payload remarkable is that it was designed and built entirely by students from the University of Colorado. A team of graduate and undergraduate students worked on the project, and here it was flying on the space shuttle. And here I was thinking that I was cool for making my own website in college. Returning to the crew cabin after its recent flight on STS-53 was the Hercules camera. This again was a system that combined a digital camera, a fiber optic gyroscope, and location data from the orbiter, in order to determine exactly what point of the Earth's surface the camera was pointed at when the crew snapped a photo. Rather than having to remember where a photo was taken, or attempt to figure it out later by using the orbiter's ephemeris, Hercules would just figure it out, down to only a few kilometers. The system was largely the same for this flight, but it can now also downlink imagery and geolocation data while in flight. We're seeing more of these updates lately, which makes me wonder if it was in preparation for the space station, which would have a much harder time sending down recorders and samples back to Earth. I can also report that when I look at photos from this mission, Hercules is no longer held to the wall with a whole bunch of duct tape, so that's also a nice upgrade. Another nifty bit of technology flying again was one of my favorites, the Shuttle Amateur Radio Experiment, or SAREX. Unfortunately, I once again have no fun anecdotes about encounters with folks on the ground. Despite three people from this flight recording oral histories, none of them had anything at all to say about this flight. Mike Fole focused on his time on Mir, and both Steve Oswald and Ellen Ochoa focused on their time in NASA upper management. Oh well, I've still got a few tidbits. As usual, the main focus for SAREX was communicating with a number of schools on the ground, giving students a chance to speak with astronauts as they sailed overhead, but they also found a few other uses. On flight day 3, the crew of Discovery exchanged brief greetings with the crew of the Russian space station Mir. The radio contact had been attempted a few times in the past, so it was nice to finally pull it off, and it also foreshadowed the upcoming shuttle Mir program. And lastly, some clever folks on the ground figured out a way to send fast scan TV back up to the shuttle. We've seen plenty of TV coming down from astronauts, but now for the first time an orbiting crew was able to see mission control from space. Oh, how the tables have turned. Commander Cameron, clearly enjoying himself, said to Capcom Sam Gamar, Hey Sam, raise your hands. Sam, wave your hands real big. Only to laugh when, sure enough, he complied. Cameron called down, I can see you on television. Tell the flight director I'm watching him every minute. You never know who's behind those lenses. Hey, this is great. Gamar can only reply, Yeah, I tell you, no place is safe anymore. On flight day 6, it was time to pick up Spartan. The pilot crew eased Discovery through an effortless rendezvous, passing underneath through the R-bar, popping up onto the V-bar, and hopping down it towards the waiting spacecraft. Mission Specialist Ochoa again operated the RMS, grappling Spartan and easing it down into the payload bay. There was some concern that the task of lowering Spartan into the berthing latches might be troublesome, perhaps because the Atlas experiment was blocking the view. With that in mind, an extra camera was added to the floor of the payload bay, and another one was added to the Spartan support equipment. The extra cameras and long hours of training seemed to have paid off, since Ochoa had no difficulty securing the free-flying payload. 
This is especially good news since, as I mentioned, Spartan had no communication system. So if you wanted all that science data, you had to retrieve the spacecraft. So good job, crew. On flight day 9, the crew packed everything up, deactivated Atlas, and closed the payload bay doors, only to discover that the weather in Florida was not cooperating and they were getting an extra day on orbit. The payload bay doors were soon opened again, allowing the radiators to do their job of cooling the orbiter. And, well, there's no sense in wasting time on orbit, so the crew reactivated most of Atlas too. The millimeter wave atmosphere sounder had to remain shut down since the shuttle's robot arm was back in its cradle and it was in the way of the big spinning dish on the instrument. Now, ah, well, can't win them all. The crew enjoyed their extra day on orbit with a little more free time and views out the window and then packed up once again to head home, this time for realsies. Entry proceeded with no difficulty and Discovery touched down with a nice gentle vertical descent rate of 2.7 kilometers per hour. As the orbiter rolled down the shuttle landing facility, the drag parachute was deployed with a slight improvement. In an effort to prevent it from pulling from one side or the other, it was updated to allow a little more air through. I guess the modification did the trick because the parachute was much better behaved this time. It had been 9 days, 6 hours, 8 minutes, and 24 seconds since liftoff, and STS-56 was in the books. With this flight, the shuttle had contributed yet another important set of data for scientists around the globe studying the sun, the atmosphere, climate, and how everything interacted together. Simply learning the very basics of how this system interacted, let alone where it was headed and how we might help maintain it, was going to be a massive collaborative effort that spanned years and involved thousands of scientists. Flights like STS-56 did their part by using their lofty vantage point to collect plenty of raw data on their own, as well as ensuring that the data from other instruments could be counted on. And every little bit helps. Next time, STS-55 regains its position as number one on the runway. In the payload bay, we'll find D-2, the second German space lab mission. Buckle up, German speakers. It's time to listen to me wrestle with your language once again. At Astra, catch you on the next pass.